miles. It's an uneasy, uneasy air, feeling descending you. through clouds, no, IMC, with no engines, and your altimeters that you're used to looking at on your six pack are saying zero. So welcome aboard everybody. I am here today and I am honored to say I'm here with my friend and honestly my hero, Bruce Monnier. Uh, you may have, if you've been following on AOP, AOPA, you may have seen a little article about a dual flame out in a citation due to fuel contamination. So if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to, to do some research on it. But today we are going to talk about, um, from Bruce's perspective, what happened in that flight, uh, what was he thinking, and uh, if there's anything that you can do in the future to uh, either avoid situations like this or just prepare for them because some things are just unavoidable. So Bruce, thank you um, for, for taking the time to, uh, to sit with us. Happy to be here. <laughs> So basically, you were flying a, a medevac flight. It was yourself, a co-pilot, and you had two medics and two passengers in the back. Is that correct? Two medics, two passengers, and a patient. In fact, you had a patient. Uh, you had a passenger with you that had a little aversion to flying. Would you say? Yeah, she had said before the flight that she was not a particular fan of small airplanes and that she was terrified of flying. And I promised her a smooth flight. We flew down to Naples, we topped off, filled up with fuel there, loaded up our passengers, everything was normal at that point. Climbed out and we were headed up to New York. Uh, we had been level at flight level 350 for probably 40 minutes at that point. And uh, we were relaxed, everything was going fine, there was no abnormal abnormalities or anything on any of the gauges. Until when fine-tuning the uh, fan speed on the number one engine, on the left engine, I was fine-tuning it, trying to get it to uh, sit right at 103%, and it started to spool back. And uh, then we, very calmly and, and uneventfully, the, the engine just shut off and quit producing thrust. So, of course, at this point, we don't really know why it rolled back. It just basically rolled back and yep the first thought was okay so the engine the engine has quit and we're on one engine we can't sustain flight at 350 so the first thing that I did was you know ask for a lower altitude that was the first thing it didn't nothing else really mattered it's just uh, time to get down otherwise you know our airspeed will bleed off the autopilot will hold us there until it stalls so we asked for a lower altitude started heading down so now you're you're heading down you're getting a lower altitude you're uh, I assume you're looking for another airport to divert to based on, on your location. But this is in, in a jet aircraft, for those who aren't familiar with jet airplanes, this is, it's, it has your attention, but it's not, this isn't life threatening. Yeah, this is an emergency, this is a, a, a non-threatening, non-event. Um, it's more of an inconvenience because you're gonna have to fly, in, we're diverting somewhere, we're gonna have to land, it's, it's changing our plans for the day. As far as danger and risk and concern, it's really a non-concern. So obviously you informed your crew, you informed the, uh, the medics in the back and the passengers that... Yeah, once we started down, uh, we let ATC know that we had lost an engine and we'd like to divert. Um, they offered us three airports, one of which was Savannah. It sounded great to us. Weather checked out, runway's plenty long. We knew it's a Class Charlie, which is great. Uh, and once we headed towards Savannah and had that under control, I had the co-pilot inform the passengers what was going on, uh, and the medics let them know why we were diverting. Although I imagine they probably heard the engine spool back and had an idea, and I'm sure the medics probably clued them in. The diversion is going pretty uneventful, other than the fact that it's a single-engine approach. 
Yeah, we're just descending down from 35, and it takes a while because you're not in a big hurry. You're not going to dump the good engine and just uh, shoot down as fast as you can. You're you're just flying, and to fly down from 35,000, even at a thousand a minute, you're still talking. It's a 35 minute trip to the ground. So yeah, we're heading towards Savannah, and we're just descending. And at this point, we've gone over the single engine approach checklist. We're not to that point yet, but we want to familiarize ourselves with it and know what to expect. We've set our V-ref because in that case, you're a lot heavier than you would normally land because we've got a lot more fuel on board. We're not ready to land. And with hey, single yeah, engine, uh, you're we'll going to have to add some speed to that V-ref for the single Thank engine, which I believe in that plane was plus check. 15. So now you're all set up for the approach. You've got your, your V-ref speed. You, you've gone over the, the checklist for single engine approach. And so you're pretty much, in your mind, you're, you're prepared. You're ready for what's going to be a pretty uneventful single engine landing. Yep, it's going to be a routine single engine approach and landing, if as routine as you can, as a single engine can be. We're coming down, we're just bleeding speed. The ATC is vectoring us in a rather large square around the airport, um, around the approach end of the airport, I should say, in our descent. When things changed and got interesting is right around 8,000 feet, the second engine, the right engine now, began to spool back just as the first did. And it's not responding to thrust inputs, and we realize we've got a second engine out. Okay, so now the second engine is out. Now things are getting interesting. Yes, at this point it's got our attention. This is no longer a routine. We've done this many times. We've trained for this. This is, well, there's no checklist, and we've not trained for this, and a lot of it is guesstimations, as there's no, no checklist for uh, no engines, there's no V speeds for no engines, there's no rev speeds, there's no best glides in a Citation 1 or to Citation 2 posted anywhere. You're at what altitude and how far are you from the airport? We're about 13 miles from the field, facing the wrong direction at 8,000 feet. And it's quiet. And it got quiet. What's, what's going through your mind? What's your, your thought process? What are you thinking about at this moment? The first thing, we've already got an airport picked out, so now we just got to confirm, can we make it there? Are we, are we high enough? Do we have enough energy to trade for distance to get there? At 8,000 feet, that basically gives me about 16 miles. Uh, we were 13 from the field. I felt like we shouldn't have a problem making it. We made it, as soon as the second one rolled back, I immediately prompted ATC for radar vectors direct, let them know we've lost the second engine, and they turned us 190 direct, direct to the field. Now, losing two engines in an airplane is a pretty rare event. I mean, we all know about Sully with the bird strikes. You obviously didn't hit any birds. Nope. At this point, have you thought about why you're losing an engine, your second engine, or are you just focusing on a task at hand, which is fly the airplane? When the first one quit, it was no concern why I quit. I didn't care. It doesn't much matter to me. When the second one quit, your immediate assumption is it's fuel related. The systems are completely independent, right engine from the left engine on the citations. So for the second one to quit in exactly the same manner, it spooled back the same way, non-violently, the fl fuel flow went to zero, and it just quit going around the quietly. You just assume it's fuel. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the citation, so here you are, you're, you're 13 miles from the airport, you're 8,000 feet, you've lost both your engines, you're eight alpha lima but lima you still have control of the airplane because the flight alpha controls lima. aren't hydraulic, right, they're more of a cable Queen. pulley, much and like you learn. Just like in your Skyhawk or your Cherokee, they're cable-driven mechanical linkage, so uh, you've got complete control of the Citation just the same. Uh, you, you, the only thing you've lost is hydraulics, which so you're not going to be able to use your thrust reversers, and you won't be able to put your gear down, theoretically, or your speed brakes. But as far as flying and gliding goes, it, glide, it, it glides just like a 172 or a 182, and um, it actually handled fairly well was pretty smooth and pretty predictable. It wasn't a brick that just fell out of the sky, thankfully. Um, so yeah, after the 8,000 and they both quit and we head towards the field, my first thought was, 
just because we need to, let's try to refire one of the engines. So I didn't have any expectations of refiring based on how it all shut down and assuming that it was bad fuel, but we've got nothing better to do and we might as well try to get it running. So we already had enough speed for a windmilling start and I had the fuel boost on, I had the ignitions on, uh, and the, the, the thrust levers vehicles. were out of lock, so theoretically they should be starting if it was going to start. But for kicks and giggles, we did push the engine start button, and we got exactly what we expected, nothing. So we shut down both engines, actually literally locked thrust levers closed. And from that point, we concentrating on, concentrated on conserving energy and making it to the field. So you've turned to, towards the airport, you're gliding, you're, you're, everything that you train for when you're doing your private pilot license, it's probably the last time you've ever really did an engine out. Yeah. A, a true glide, actually, I scratch that, your commercial license when you had to do power out 180s is probably the last time you... Yeah, you do, a, in, in multi-engines and in the jets, you do a lot of single-engine training. In fact, most of your training in your checks are single-engine, but you don't do anything with no engines. So, yeah, you revert back to what you learned as a student pilot, basically, and that's the last time you were in a glider with engines. <laughs> so you revert back, you're, you're now gliding, you, you've chosen an, an airspeed. To, to glide at, and, and how did you, because as you mentioned earlier, there is no, no glide speed set in the book, so how did you come up with your, your air speed at that point? Well, we do have an angle of attack indicator, and we've got the altimeter, or the, well, the altimeter, and the attitude indicator, but mostly as far as the speed goes, it's kind of a, a feel, it was a feel, and we felt like once it, my co-pilot and I both agreed that 160 felt like a nice speed. It looked like it was giving us a reasonable descent at a reasonable airspeed. Um, and realistically, it was just a, a feel and a, a, the butter meter and the, the gut feeling of this is it. And it, it had a, the same type of glide ratio, the same kind of pitch, the same look as basically short final or when you're on V-Ref which is at idle typically anyway, so it had a very similar feel to that. It wasn't an abnormal, unusual attitude at any, at any point. So now you're coming in, you got your glide speed set, you, got your, you see what your descent rate is, but the question is, is that gonna be enough to make the field? Yeah, so typically your Cherokees and your Skyhawks and everything, I think everybody basically teaches and understands that a, a typical glide ratio just for easy math is 10 to 1. And at 10 to 1, at 8,000 feet, you can go 80,000 feet forward. Well, your 320s, your Airbus 320s, your 747s, all those big guys, those are closer to 17 or 18 to 1. So I'm guessing, and it's purely an educated guess, that these are somewhere between the two, but closer to the 10 to 1. So I was thinking a 12 to 1, which gives you a nice, easy, convertible number when looking at the alt altimeter. It's a two to one on the altimeter, meaning if you have 8,000 feet, you can go 16 miles. If you had 4,000 feet, you'd be able to go eight miles. It's similar to how they do it in the airliners, but they use a three to one rule, which is what an 18 to one ratio would work out to. So being 8,000 feet, theoretically, we can go 16 to one if my gorilla math was right. And as it turned out, the further we went down and we kept checking that number at 7,000, you know, theoretically we could go 14, and it looked like we were on the right side of that curve. We were going to make it. At that point, we really only had two serious concerns left. Um, one that's typical, well, neither of them are typically a concern, but the first one being, we're coming down, the engine won't refire, neither of them are going, we're just gliding down. Everyone above you is coming down. There's a layer, an uh, overcast layer below us. So, as best we can tell, I think we asked ATC, and they confirmed that it was uh, clear below 3,000. But we could see there was a layer, and it turned out to be between 3,000 and 4,500. So we did know we had to go through that. Now, we're radar vectors from ATC and looking at the GPS, and we know we're going directly to the field, so there's nothing else we can do. We're keeping this best glide as best we understand. 
and we're going through the clouds and that's uh you know, you're just hoping, kind of like when you're a, a fresh IFR pilot and you pop out of the clouds and you see the airport, it had that feeling when we came through the clouds at about 3,000 and the airport was where it belonged and it was in front of us. So let's back up a second here. So before you pop through those clouds, yep. you've got about 40, you said 4,500 to 3,000. So you got about 1,500 feet worth of overcast that you've got to break through. Yep. So. Not that big of a deal, instrument pilot, even though you're gliding, but you got your altimeter, you got your attitude indicator, you've got the systems that um, keep you on track. But just because, you know, you know, kind of like when you're in the sim and you're going through training at, you know, a, a flight safety or a simcom, um, we're gonna throw one more curveball at you, aren't we? Are you referring to when the altimeters quit working? Oh, that's exactly what I'm referring to. <laughs> Going through right around 6,000 feet, we're, we still don't know why. It doesn't really make any sense. Not sure if it was a battery drain or if it was some kind of who knows what. Right through about 6,000 feet, we lost our altimeters. They're digital, uh, digital altimeters, and they just kind of went haywire and weren't showing us anything. Now, of course, we do have a backup. It's in a less convenient place to look at and watch. Um, but at the time, you know, I asked ATC, do you have an altitude on us? And they said, no, we've lost it. And we lost the altitude. So we knew where we were at. It's just you don't, there's nothing. It's an uneasy, uneasy feeling descending through clouds, IMC, with no engines. And your altimeters that you're used to looking at on your six pack are saying zero. <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, I did flicker the, uh, the main battery off and then back on, which did seem to reset the altimeters and they came back on as we were going through the clouds. It was nice. We did still have our vertical speed, so it wasn't really a big deal and it wasn't that concerning other than you don't like seeing more things fail, not knowing, okay, well, what might be next? But as it turned out, uh, they came back on relatively quickly and it was a non-issue from there. And ATC did call up and say, okay, we've got you at, you know, 50 something hundred feet or whatever it was and so then so that that was back on track <laughs> uh, so when we're coming through at 3000 now we've got a few things we got to discuss so we've we've talked about it briefly and we're briefing it again we're discussing okay I don't expect the gear to go down because the gear is hydraulic the hydraulic pumps are probably not working or running due to the engines being off so we I read the placard again, okay, we're gonna pull this handle, we're gonna turn this, we're gonna pull that, okay, that's how we're gonna drop it pneumatically if needed. So the 185, contact now I did ask center, ATC if I could get over to tower because I wanted tower to confirm that they could see the gear. I know they can't legally tell confirm that the gear is down, but they could tell me that it appears down, which would be good because I didn't know if we would end up with lights, we wouldn't end up with lights, it would go down, wouldn't go down, blow it down. You know, I just wanted every available resource, right? So we discussed we're going to do the gear early enough that if it doesn't go down, we got time to blow it down and maybe have a few attempts at it before we land because there is no go around. We're not going. We're not going. We are landing one way or the other. So uh, I think somewhere around 1,500 feet, we gave it the first go, and we dropped the gear down normally with the switch, and immediately we had a green light on the nose gear, which always comes up first, and then. With a slight pause, a little longer than normal, we got a left gear and then a longer pause, maybe four or five seconds, and the right gear lit up. And all three green yeah, come on, so our assumption is there was enough windmilling in the engines to turn the accessory gearbox to turn the hydraulic enough that we had hydraulics and the gear dropped that and gravity and wind, and we got three green. And we were, and I, I asked my co-pilot, he concurred that we were both convinced so we got three green they're down and locked no reason to blow the gear okay, and that's one there, less uh, item we got to sweat and, and that was out of our minds gears down so gears down you're on on sh short final at this point eight alpha yeah Lima. fairly short we're, we're uh, inside of a thousand feet probably um, not laterally but uh, altitude and it's time to start introducing flaps and and everything else because we know we're going to make the field we know we're making the runway and at this point, uh, you know, at this point, 
the adventure's almost over. You know, now it's just a matter of putting in a nice landing. In fact, I think I commented to Jerry that I had promised the woman in the back a smooth flight, so I was going to make every effort to make sure it was a smooth landing. Convince so, her we knew what we were doing. <laughs> so despite the fact that you were coming in, no engines, you still didn't forget that conversation you had in the beginning of the flight that you were going to give her a good flight? No, not at all. Uh, in fact, uh, on the way down, I kind of felt bad for her because her she doesn't fly often, and when she does, she's scared to death, and now this happens to her, a dual engine failure. It, it could have happened to someone that was a little more comfortable flying. But, but yeah, we uh, before we touched down, we did discuss which systems are going to work and which ones aren't. And on rollout, we said, okay, we're going to land. Gear's already down. We're not worried about that. Rollout, tow brakes should work fine. That's a completely separate system. Our speed brakes won't work because we don't have hydraulics. We're not even going to bother trying them. And other than that, uh, thrust, reversers, thrust reversers won't work, so we weren't going to bother with those. But I think we had a 9,000-foot runway. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I think we had somewhere around a 9,000-foot runway, so we weren't worried about running out of the runway and expected the brakes to work. So I uh, did everything I could to flare nicely and give her a nice landing and it turned out it was a smooth landing and a very quiet one at that and we just came to a stop there were fire trucks halfway down the runway to meet us and we pulled over next to them just in case but the firemen walked up to the to the airplane which was a relief that meant we weren't on fire and there were no chunks hanging out so at that point we knew uh, the adventure's over we're on the ground safe and sound So you land the airplane, the plane's now stopped, you stopped in the middle of the runway. ATC then proceeded to ask you what? I'm not sure the tower knew the whole extent of the emergency. I think they were just told a, a, pl a uh, plane with engine failure was coming in uh, because they asked where we were parking and it, that was kind of comical. <laughs> so obviously you're not going anywhere, they're, they're sending a tug out. You, uh, the, your passengers in the back, your, both the, the medics and the passengers, they kind of have a puzzled look because they're not quite sure why we're sitting there. Yeah, as it turned out, when we were coming down through 20-some thousand, whatever it was, we had uh, let them know we had lost an engine and we were diverting to Savannah. So they understood that and they knew all that. Now, at some point going down, the I had pulled the thrust levers back for a, a descent and the, there wasn't enough bleed air to continue to pressurize the cabin, and the pressurization had gotten goofy for a moment, which made everybody's ears pop and so on. And I put a little power back in, come down, and uh, you know the pilots cleared their ears. We were talking, everything was fine. I'm guessing that the passengers may not have cleared their ears as well or the same or whatever the case was because when the second engine rolled back, they didn't hear it. They didn't know it. Uh, apparently, they thought it was just an idle, and we were coming in, and it was just quiet. And they actually, none of the passengers in the back, the five in the back, had any idea the second engine had quit until we were on the ground, and it was silent. <laughs> it's probably better they didn't know ahead of time. Yeah. That there were, they they lose the second engine. And at that point, you had There's your hands. they could do about it anyway. And, and yeah, we... We were up here concentrating on conserving energy. We didn't brief them on, oh, by the way, we've got no engines. Because last thing I want to hear is people in the back screaming anyway. So it turns out after we landed uh, and we told them this, the passengers, not the medics, but the passengers had asked how we remained so calm up here because they had no idea that there was anything out of the ordinary. And to them, it looked like we were just pushing buttons as normal and flying as normal. The approach looked like it was normal. It came into the airfield. They just assumed this is what a single engine approach looks like. <laughs> So you land, the firemen are there, the passengers now realize you lost both engines. Obviously, they're, they're grateful to your, your skills uh, and how calm you are. And what's the very next thing you did? I excused myself from the cockpit, went to the back, grabbed my lunchbox, and started eating an apple. <laughs> <laughs> Which the woman that apparently her nerves still hadn't rested yet, she goes, I can't believe that you're calm enough that you're going to come back here and just eat an apple like nothing ever happened. And the medics advised her, this is what he does when we land. He seeks out food and he gets something to eat. <laughs> now I can tell you firsthand 
that that is exactly what you, you do. Every time we land anywhere, if there is a glimmer of time, we are going to eat. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Got to feed. <laughs> This man has not missed a meal, and I guess a dual engine failure isn't about to to change that either. I can't always count on Baron Pilot bringing me peanut butter and honey. <laughs> you mean these? <laughs> yeah, those peanut butter and honey. Seven single box Jack. At this point, you're assuming it's fuel contamination, because typically in a in a jet. Um, you're only going to lose two engines for one of two things, fuel contamination and fuel starvation. Clearly, you were topped off, you had plenty of fuel, uh, so the fuel starvation 21. wasn't an option. We had 3,800 pounds of fuel on when we landed. So, it, obviously at that point, Say it again. had to be fuel contamination. So, Blue 1251, uh, the just as it will turn out to be, after, uh, the um, fast forward now, they, they look into forward. it all. It turns out that there was DEF added to the fuel. And so for those who aren't familiar with what DEF is, um, explain what DEF is and, and where it's used. Diesel vehicles built after 2010 require what's called DEF, diesel exhaust fluid. It's an additive that you don't put in the fuel, you put in a separate tank in diesel trucks, and that is pumped into the exhaust to reburn emissions and make them a little more Friendly, environmentally friendly. Uh, this DEF is not made to be mixed with any fuel, whether it be diesel fuel or jet fuel. In this case, it inadvertently, a DEF container was used to transport the PRIST, which PRIST is an anti-ice agent that you do add to jet fuel to stop any water that's in the jet fuel from freezing and crystallizing, and also it's got an antimicrobial in it to stop uh, little uh, bacteria growing in your, in your in the water in the jet fuel. So they used a DEF container to transfer press from a 55-gallon drum to the 5-gallon drum on the truck, and apparently a very small dose of DEF can be fatal to an engine. So the reason DEF and the containers even come, came into play is because certain jets, um, i.e. the Citation uh, ones and twos, for example, um, have Chris added into their fuel. Not all jets do, so not all jets would, are exposed to this, but in this case, these jets are. And unbeknownst to, to you, because even as a pilot, you have no way of verifying if Chris is indeed added to the fuel if it's being added it's not like straining the fuel is going to show you a different color there's really nothing you can do yeah there's no test as a pilot uh it, it, watching them put it in you know even if you watch them closely they're pumping in out of a jet a truck and they've got the press lever turned on which is what you're looking for so press is being pumped in it looks normal it smells normal it goes in there's no something that's going to tell you what it is there's no gauge that tells you what it is and at that point there's there's no possible way of knowing that you've got DEF contamination. So I know when this event first happened, um, you uh, you know very humble about it and you know and didn't uh, want to take a lot of credit. But I personally, for, uh, I for one, and I'm sure the people on board and really anyone who's watching this, uh, would say you you, create, you did an amazing feat. You you saved uh, seven lives. You saved property. Um, from being damaged, and uh, and you're probably the only person in history that has glider time in a citation, and essentially you became a test pilot. I mean, I don't even know if when they certify these airplanes, if they've ever shut down two engines in flight. So you definitely have have done something that nobody before you, and hopefully nobody after you, um, will ever do again. And, uh, and as I said, look, I get chills as, as I even say this, but you truly are um, a hero to me and, and to many people involved. And, you know, in the words of Bob Hoover, you fly the plane uh, to the scene of the accident. That's it. And you continue uh, to fly the airplane. Uh, the biggest thing that's changed is, I mean, the, the attitude that I have when flying, it's a very relaxed attitude. When things go badly, I'm still very relaxed. In an emergency situation, still very relaxed. I'm not really a warrior or a nervous person. But what I did take away from it is, soon after that, I started training for the Citation 7, the 650. And it did put a lot more emphasis on 
knowing your systems and knowing the airplane, knowing what systems are going to fail, what systems are, are expected to work, and I think that made that a lot more real for me, you know, knowing, knowing that. Because I know um, when I was a student pilot, yeah, I learned everything about the airplane, and I knew everything there was to know about the archers when I was flying them. But then I would go into a Skyhawk, and my attitude was almost, all right, well, I know the V-speeds, I can fake the rest. And it, you know, and then I went into this plane, and that plane, and this plane, and it reminds you the importance of knowing the systems. Because the systems can be completely different. Some have hydraulic air alarms, some have mechanical, some are backed up with uh, something else. In some cases, the pneumatics for blowing down the gear are also with the brakes. Some aren't. So, and it, it goes on and on and on. And I do feel like after that, it did set into me how, the importance of learning the systems on a, on a new aircraft. Yeah, I think that's a really good lesson um, for all of us. In fact, even listening to you say it uh, is actually makes me realize that that's something that I could be doing as well um, in, in all the airplanes that I fly. Um, I think that's a really valuable lesson. Uh, well, well said. Thanks. So on that note, uh, you know, thank you for, for taking this time. Thank you for, for talking to us. Uh, for those who want to learn more about what happened, you can re research DEF uh, jet uh, dual engine failure. Uh, I know the FBOs all got alerts uh, about this. This has actually been all over. While it hasn't hit mainstream media for some reason, it has been all over the industry, uh, inside all the industry magazines and stuff. As always, guys, if you like these videos, be sure to hit that thumbs up and subscribe button. Biggest compliment I can receive is your subscription to the channel. And I hope you enjoyed. This is a little bit different than uh, the normal videos we do, but hopefully you enjoyed this. And go ahead and. Uh, and leave uh, your comments down below. Let us know what you think. Uh, go ahead and uh, Bruce will be uh, taking a look at the comments and any messages you want to send to him. Uh, be sure to do it there. So until next time, guys, stay safe and uh, we'll see you in the next one.